So on this week's podcast, I wanted to post a recent show that I did with the Heart and Soil crew on Radical Health Radio. This is the Heart and Soil podcast. It was filmed at Heart and Soil headquarters in Dripping Springs, Texas. And I'm proud of what they're doing there. Steve is an amazing co-host. He was such a cool guy to sit down with. We had an incredible conversation about vegan diets, about plant-based diets, benefits, risks, misconceptions. Are they really growing? Is it just a propaganda machine? All these issues we talk about in this podcast with Steve and the crew at Radical Health Radio. If you listen to my podcast, Fundamental Health, I really think you will enjoy Radical Health Radio, especially if you want something that's a little bit less technical. The crew there does an amazing job at breaking stuff down in a less technical fashion, a little more high level. One of the things I like doing on my podcast is getting technical, but if you want something high level on health topics of all sorts, check out Radical Health Radio with the crew from Heart and Soil. Steve, like I said, is an amazing host. Enjoy this show with them. I really enjoyed doing it. I actually don't think a plant-based diet is that popular with humans anymore. Mm. I think we are really propagandized. We're programmed to believe it is because that's what that's how we get people to join it. If, if everyone else is doing it, Steve, Man, if there's a line of people at the plant-based burger joint, there's something good over there. Mm -hmm. But I just don't believe that's true. If you talk to the grocery store managers, they'll tell you not, you don't even have to probe that much. The plant-based meats don't sell that no. well. Welcome back to the show, Radical Health Seekers. Do we have a good one in store for you today? Because I have the one and only Paul Saladino in the studio live, and we discuss the plant-based elephant in the room. We are tackling plant-based and vegan diets in a very nuanced and compassionate way, because we're not here to just poke fun and say, this is why we're right and you're wrong, but here to highlight what are some of the misconceptions, the common myths, and some of the agendas that are maybe driving this growing trend of plant-based diets. And also Paul's opinion on whether this is actually a growing trend or we're just being led to believe that it's a growing trend. And of course, the antidote, which is radical health and hopefully bringing people back to an animal-based diet that's supportive of health and our farming and our soil and our ecosystems. And then, of course, as always, we get into our questions for the show. We hear about feeding babies raw liver and real foods. We talk about LDL numbers going up on an animal-based diet. And we have an interesting question about how to ask good questions about the quality of scientific studies to facilitate one's learning. So tune in. Let's get it with Mr. Paul Saladino. Hello, Radical Health Radio family. I hope you're having a wonderful day. We have a doozy of an episode for you today because we've got a return guest on the show, the one and only Mr. Dr. Paul Saladino, formerly Carnivore MD, now Paul Saladino MD. Welcome to HQ, man. I mean, this is your old stomping grounds. Feels weird for me to sit in this seat and introduce you, but we're going to do this thing. How are you feeling? I love it, dude. Thanks for having me on. It's good to be here. I love being here. I love what we've built here at Heart and yeah. Soil with the HQ. I know when I was here the other day, Melanie and I did a little content walking around mm -hmm. HQ. And so I'm excited for people to see that a little bit more of the vibe here and the people here. And I don't know if people know, there's like an outdoor area there where people yeah. get in the sun. There's a cold plunge, a sauna, there's a ping pong table, there's a weight, there's a gym and yeah. there's a forge. And it's a really cool spot we've got here, man. It's, good to be it, here. it's incredible. I get the treat of coming here and batching these episodes. And every time I'm coming, for a work trip. I'm like so jazzed. I get to talk to awesome people like you. I get to play in this amazing place. Like you said, the culture is just out of this world. The, the shirtless, the bare feet, the moving, the good food, the steaks. It's pretty nice, man. It's, you know, it's like, I think that when I was in Costa Rica, people don't know this about me, but I, um, so I lived in Santa Teresa for a little while and I met, um, I, I guess I, I, I met a really well-known tech entrepreneur. We'll leave it at that. Um, and and he said to me, he was really impressed with Heart and Soil because he was so excited about the alignment of a business and people doing well in the business mm -hmm. and like people doing well on the backside of the business. So as your business grows, you're helping more people. Like mm -hmm. as you help more people, as people learn the message, even if they don't get supplements, they're getting organs, they're getting the message, they're learning about what we teach about. As you do that, the business grows. So mm -hmm. it's just this incredible alignment. And that's what we see here, like with the culture that the people here, and this is what's so cool about being here at HQ is just that people are here for a reason. We all believe something 
um, it's closer to a church mm-hmm. or the best kind of cult. <laughs> yes, exactly. Than, than, than anything else. Yeah. yeah. I think about that word. You said the, the C word, cult. Yeah. <laughs> but it comes from the word culture, right? And yeah. you're, you just said that. The culture here is yeah. amazing. Yeah. So if there's going to be a cult, it's this kind of cult. Like this is the good cult to be in. Well, we think so. And kind of a nice segue, the, the cult that we wanted to talk about today uh-huh. is this whole like plant-based thing. Because it seems on one hand that we are two polar opposite ends of the spectrum, like the animal-based community, the carnivores, all of that versus the plant-based. And this language of verses even and othering and all of that stuff. And I think actually we've got a lot more in common than we have differences and we want the same things fundamentally, but maybe our vehicle for getting those a little bit different. So we wanted to chat today about kind of discussing that, this whole plant-based thing. You're obviously blowing up, raising tons of awareness around the animal-based diet and spreading that message. So with that kind of in the arena, where did the whole plant-based thing originate from your perspective? Because it wasn't the way of our ancestors and it's get, getting more popular and it's growing in popularity. So where's this story begin? Well, you said something at the end there that we'll, we'll challenge eventually. The, okay. the notion that it's getting more popular and growing is, is something I want to challenge Good. Uh, because I'm not convinced about that. But I, I think that if we go back to the origins of the plant-based movement. I'm, I'm not a scholar in the history of right. the plant-based movement, but you can look at the history and you you pointed it out very very clearly and eloquently there. Our ancestors never did this. No mm-hmm. one ever did a plant-based diet by choice. It was it was starvation. Yeah. The plant-based diet is called starvation historically. The Hadza will seek meat and organs. They always eat them together. They never waste they never waste anything, and that's their first goal every day is to hunt and to get the meat and the organs. The whole tribe rejoices. Yeah. We see this over and over. Weston Price documented this. Basically, every person that's gone to, vigit, gone to visit humans that are living more like our ancestors, and there's not too many of them left mm-hmm. on the earth right now, sees this. It's just, it's so evident in, in where we come from as humans. And so really, I think it's only within the last 100 or so years that this notion that meat is something we should avoid mm-hmm. has arisen. And I think it goes back to a religious group mm. called the Seventh-day Adventist. There's a lot of interesting stories around this. So the perhaps the, the original story or one of the most striking stories is of the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan, 1894, I believe is the date. And you have John Harvey Kellogg. Mm. This is of Kellogg's cereals fame. Um, he's perhaps the great grandfather of Tony the Tiger and you know mm. cornflakes or the rooster on the cornflakes. Who knows? But <clears throat> you know John Harvey Kellogg was raised by Seventh Day Adventists, and I think that we'll just pause here and and just I will say that I think that the intentions w- of the Seventh Day Adventist religion are good, mm-hmm. just like the intentions of a plant based diet are good. Mm-hmm. Um, in the early 1900s, there was a lot of debauchery in the American culture. There was a lot of drunk drunkenness. This was around the time of prohibition and questions. And I think we were struggling with our identity as humans within our American culture. And there was a lot of abuse of alcohol and probably other drugs as well. And so in perhaps in reaction to that, the Seventh-day Adventist movement gained some steam. Mm. And there was this kind of temperance movement to, to be a better version of humans, which it involves avoiding alcohol. I mean, Mormon faith is connected with this. A lot of religions have this this sort of this imperative or this this urging with, built within them, like be a better version of yourself. Maybe these substances are not bringing out who you are. Mm. But connected with that, with the Seventh Day Adventist, was kind of a demonization of something that I think is fundamentally human, which is our sex drive and our vitality. Mm-hmm. And if you go back to Latin roots of the word meat, carne, carnal, it's we've known <laughs> for thousands of years that meat and organs, which we've always eaten together, lead to libido, Mm -hmm. which is the fancy medical word for sex drive, being horny, which I think is a a wonderful, beautiful thing to celebrate, fertility, families. But as we know, like so many things as humans, this can become corrupted too. And Mm -hmm. I think the Seventh-day Adventists saw it as a dirty thing. And specifically, they saw self-pleasuring masturbation as a dirty thing. And so what John Harvey Kellogg wanted to do at the Battle Creek Sanitarium, sanitarium is this historical word for in you know mental health hospital Mm. um was to help people there or you know work with people there to have them masturbate less Mm. to have them self-pleasure less and so what did he do well he designed Mm cornflakes this is the genesis of cornflakes and what he believed and what he saw was that bland diets 
cornflakes is about as bland as you get if you've ever put did you did you eat cornflakes as a kid yeah we have cornflakes and it's uh it's not very fun um yeah we have the frosted flakes obviously, right, right and right. they get the sugar on them because the cornflakes just alone they taste like absolutely nothing it's basically like a paper towel and yes, milk right? right it's about as bland as you get but what john harvey kellogg realized and i think what the seventh day Adventists realized is that a bland diet and bland is basically the opposite of meat mm -hmm. and organs is helps you manage your sex drive mm. by essentially quelling your sex drive, removing your sex drive. In some ways, this may sound intense, but you might parallel this with the surgeries that were done for people with a lobotomy. Yeah. You know, you, you, you can lobotomize your sex drive. You can surgically quote, remove your sex drive by limiting the nutrients that are necessary to make sex hormones in men and women. And that will get rid of your sex drive or that will help you control it but it also takes away a fundamental, central, beautiful part of what it is to be a human. Mm. Just like if someone has a mental illness, you can remove the frontotemporal lobes of their brain and the lobotomy, but that's removing a piece of what it is to be human. So I think that's the beginning of the plant-based movement is a Seventh-day Adventist and John Harvey Kellogg, 1894, the Battle Creek Sanitarium. What's crazy, I'll just add this, is that I did a content piece about that on Instagram mm. and it got taken down. Because Instagram said it was false information. And I was and I looked and I was like, this is recorded yeah, history. Right. It's just that history is written, it used to be written by the victors. Mm. Now it's written by the tech oligarchs. Mm -hmm. So somebody at Instagram, somebody at Meta has decided that's a piece of history that we want whitewashed. Mm. We don't want people to understand that. How crazy is that? That's very crazy. And it points at maybe something we should get into into this conversation, which is that seems agenda driven, whether that agenda is profit or whether that agenda is something more nefarious, but it's pretty wild to lay out that story. And, you know, the rooster on the, on the front of the Kellogg's box sounds like it's uh, more cockadoodle don't than cockadoodle do yeah, yeah. <laughs> to kind of remove this, like you said, our humanness, our humanness is procreation. It is sex drive. It is vitality. So you look at that as a problem because it's dirty or unclean or whatever it is. And what do you do? You attack the human, you, you attack the species, you reduce its vitality. And one of the things I always think about with the plant-based conversation is, we'll get into these nuances, but one of the core topics and arguments is, I don't want to cause harm to animals. And I always think almost like a personal Hippocratic oath of first do no harm. What if you're doing harm to yourself by removing the most nutrient dense foods on the planet in the, in the name of helping reduce suffering to animals? Like what's your take on that? I agree with you completely. I think that, who knows? We all probably have to create some sort of spiritual framework that we will use to navigate the world. But I've always felt like my one of my highest responsibilities was to be the best conduit for valuable information for people. And I went to medical school. I mm -hmm. was trained as a doctor. Mostly I do educational stuff on social media, Instagram now. I don't see patients one-on-one. -on -one. But as a physician, my oath was do no harm, but to help people to do good work in the world by using an intellect mm -hmm. to do things in the world that are good. And I've always felt like if the diet you're eating doesn't enable you to do the most good in the world, is that really the most responsible diet? Is that really the most compassionate diet? Is that empathetic? And I think there are certainly people who believe that a plant-based diet will enable them to do good in the world. Right. That's a separate thing. But there are many within the plant-based and vegan communities who we love and respect and are empathetic toward who will also say, I don't care yeah. if it harms me. Yeah. I'm not going to harm an animal. And you think, what good could they do in the world yeah. that they're not able to do because they're not giving their body the nutrients it needs to truly thrive? And that's really a difficult argument to make is that the, the nutrients in animal foods, I mean, this is something I'm sure you talk about on the podcast that I talk about on my social media all the time, it's very hard to argue that a plant-based diet is more nutrient-rich mm -hmm. than an animal-based diet, or even in any way, shape, or form, a shadow of an animal-based diet yeah. in terms of nutrients. And so th the real clear reality is that if you are not including animal foods in your diet, you need to work very hard to replace all of those nutrients, some of which we don't even know about, mm -hmm. with synthetic, suboptimal, less fully bioavailable, non-bioidentical forms. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly going to limit what you can achieve in the world, how kind you can be to your children, people you meet, your creativity. What good could you do in the world with that nourishment? But we can talk about other arguments and nuances behind you know, wanting to do harm to things around mm -hmm. you because I think that I, I always go back to this if people are, have heard me interviewed talking about the ethics of a vegan diet. Life requires death, mm -hmm. right? In order for something to live, something else must die. This is the way of life. And that's not something that 
the Hadza shy away from. Mm -hmm. They celebrate it. I think that we've forgotten this because we're so removed. Very yeah. few of us are hunting. But if you were hunting, if you really had to hunt and gather all of your food, we would realize very quickly that there is no life without death. That's a cycle. That's okay. I think it should be done respectfully and with the intention of what we do with that nourishment in mind. But you can't avoid that. Yeah. It's really just a fallacy. It's a delusion. Mm -hmm. Going back to the idea of mental health, I mean, it's delusional to think that we can live without resulting in some sort of death. Mm -hmm. I mean, you drive your car, you're gonna run over a bug on the highway. You are driving your car, there's gonna be a cricket that flies into the windshield. You're you're harming things. There are actually religious adherents, I think it's called the, the Jains or the mm -hmm. Giants, who like just, they don't even wanna harm anything. So they just try and breathe, mm -hmm. and, you know, these breatharians, they, they don't even wanna harm a bug or any, it's just at some level we think to exist in the world, we must impact other things and that's okay depending on the spirit and the responsibility with which we do that walk. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, there's examples from the East where some of those monks will have kind of helpers walk in front of them, sweep in the streets and, and all kinds of stuff like that to avoid that harm, but there's no escape in it. And you said about that spiritual framework, what's really interesting. I've studied a lot of like these more ancestrally appropriate tribes and spiritually speaking, some of these medicine men in these tribes might be the most spiritually connected people in in the world that we could find today they they believe in animism everything is alive and they really have this celebratory aspect of life and death and what i always found very fascinating in those cultures the medicine men that were conducting the shamanic or doctoral work within those cultures they reserved the meat for those people because they needed the strength in order to be the conduit of healing for the other people and that meant that if there was only a small amount of meat it was going to the medicine man because he could do the most good and everybody else would fall back on the survival food like the plants and they're the most spiritually connected people in the world, you know, in, 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 in arguably, I guess. Yeah. And if you look deeper, I mean, down the rabbit hole of a vegan delusion or a plant-based delusion said with the most compassion I possibly can to, to prepare a field to grow plants Ugh. requires killing thousands, tens of thousands of bugs, insects, rodents, snakes, displacing birds. Yeah. So there is no life without death. And it's just a matter of where you choose to put that. And I think when you look at this, this isn't the most sexy conversation growing plants on the land without an animal input, whether you're putting manure or worm castings, yep. or you're actually having a cow graze on that land, you are removing, it's a one-way street. You're bringing nutrients from the soil to the plant, and then you're eating the plant, and then you're not putting your poop back mm -hmm. in that soil. You're putting your poop in the, in the sewage. Mm -hmm. So you're, it's only a one-way street. You're just removing nutrients from the soil. How is that respecting the soil? Mm -hmm. The way that these ecosystems are supposed to work is that animals are all sharing the nutrients, right? A a vole or a or a, a badger or whatever, you know, is digging in the ground. A rabbit is gonna eat some of the plants, then it's pooping and peeing, it goes back into the soil. We're removing that with one direction. I mean, all of these industrial agriculture, your kale is grown industrially, perhaps it's grown biodynamically in your backyard, but the majority of what's in grocery stores yeah. is on these large tracks. Even if it's an organic farm, it's a one-way transit. It's a one-way road of nutrients and minerals and you know, vital pieces of the soil into the plants and either into landfills, which are not gonna be used to regrow soil, into sewage systems. It's, it's a crazy thing. So how is that not destroying an mm -hmm. ecosystem? How is that not destroying the land? I really think that when you imagine that and you understand that, that a systematic, a cyclic version is the only way in which life continues, having animals and plants on the land at the same time is the only compassionate way to produce your food. Yeah. You cannot produce plant food without animals. Yeah. Yeah, and that breaks the whole, the, the, the house of cards already starts to tremble under that light breeze. Yeah. And then you get into other arguments. Like I, I would I would classify this as the cost of progress in a sense. Like you said, the the cyclical nature, the symbiosis of life eating life and these these ruminant animals and smaller animals and bugs and everything that needs to be connected to to give the soil its nourishment, to grow the foods, to feed the humans who eventually will also become the soil, right. whether we get or buried we should, or cremated. Yeah. Or, and, and it's, yeah, you know, there's that old saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Like this is progress. This is almost necessary to some degree to feed seven and a half billion people, but there's a better way to do it. It's not these massive factories. It's not these agricultural models of farming with row crops as far as the eye can see and glyphosate sprayed all over everything. It's this regenerative agriculture model. It's humans eating that way, supporting those systems, supporting the farmers and bringing back this holistic cycle, which seems to kind of maybe get missed in the whole plant-based argument. I think it's badly missed. 
Um, there's a great example. I think the woman's name is Lierre Keith and she wrote a book called the, I think it's the vegetarian myth. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. But she talked about having a garden and wanting so badly to not harm anything mm -hmm. or to not kill anything. And the slugs were coming and eating her lettuce and she has to remove the slugs <laughs> or kill the slugs. They come back and just, you see it firsthand when people are actually connected with the way their food is mm -hmm. grown. And, and she had to put animal inputs into the soil. You have to put manure, worm castings, bones. It, it's all a part of this cycle. Now, people will then say it's not scalable. Mm. right? You can't scale regenerative agriculture. You can't do it. And I think, okay, that's putting the cart before the horse. This is kind of a straw manning type of action. Um, I think we start small and we scale and then we figure out with scientists and engineers who are nourished by this good mm -hmm. food, how to address the problem when it comes up. Because the flip side of the coin is also something to consider. You can't scale plant agriculture no. either. I don't know what end game someone who's advocating for a vegan diet wants, but you know, if you listen to the heads of Impossible Burger or Beyond Foods, they want to eliminate all cows. Mm -hmm. They want all, in fact, all animal agriculture because they want to eliminate all chickens, all pigs. Mm -hmm. Do they understand the eventuality of that? That is complete ecosystem collapse. That is not sustainable in any way, shape or form. That is plants growing on the land, the land becoming fallow or barren within a few generations and everyone starving and dying. Mm -hmm. How is that a good eventuality? That doesn't make any sense to me. How is no one considering this? There's just rhetoric and this bombastic bloviating happening with these people mm -hmm. and no one is questioning them saying, hey, that makes no sense. There's this amazing romantic fairy tale. Mm. We're never going to harm any animals. Plants don't even feel it when you kill them, when, you know, which we can talk about. <laughs> There's nothing else affected when you grow spinach on a piece of land and it's going to go on forever and it's more sustainable and it's better for the environment. It, it's just, it's like you said, it's built on sand and it's a complete house of cards. These supplements have changed my life. Check out this review on mood, memory, and brain from heart and soil supplements. Madison says, I've been vegan my entire life and have some concerns about my health, specifically micronutrients and iron levels. I decided to take mood, memory, and brain from heart and soil in order to try and resolve some issues. This supplement is the one that warrants a review. I've struggled with severe depression my entire life. After two weeks of taking these pills, my depression is gone. I have energy in the morning. I feel like I'm able to live my life. These supplements have really changed the quality of my life and I recommend them to everyone. Thanks to Dr. Saladino and everyone at Heart and Soil. I'm a customer for life. This kind of stuff makes me so proud of what we do at Heart and Soil. You can find all of our supplements at heartandsoil.co. Mood, Memory, and Brain contains grass-fed brain, grass-fed liver, and grass-fed bone marrow. All of our supplements are from grass-fed, grass-finished cattle in New Zealand, finest on the planet, regeneratively raised in glass containers because plastic is bullshit. Find us at heartandsoil.co. Mood, Memory, and Brain specifically contains incredible nutrients found in the brains of animals like phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylcholine, all kinds of magical peptides there that support mental function. Hardensoil.co, back to the podcast. Yeah, and it, it's so sexy. It's so trendy to take that whole vegan hand grenade, lob it over the fence and just run away because it's like, better for the planet, better for the animals, better for you. Cholesterol's bad, red meat's bad, you know, kind. And it feels like a furry tale. And as soon as you start to just poke holes, you're like, wait a minute. But that brings up an interesting point because you can also speak here, not as a guy throwing uh, stones in a glass house, so to speak, because you did veganism. I've toyed with the idea of veganism after watching Cowspiracy and my God, the cow farts are destroying the planet. So clearly, once you re-examine, if you're a critical thinker, you can kind of start to see through the cracks, if you will. But it gets people and it is sexy. And I guess, you know, this maybe brings back the earlier point you wanted to talk about in the growing popularity of it or the seeming growing popularity of it and then the constriction and then the collapse when people's either health starts to fall apart or maybe they get a little curious. So what's your explanation for that? Is it just, is it this emotional tug that's got people because they generally want to be good? And then what happens thereafter when you do become a vegan for a year and a half? Good question. So I, I don't know the exact numbers on this. We might fact check them, but my impression, I think that I will, I will get it on the scale. The Seventh-day Adventist church, so back to that, I mean, we're talking millions of dollars every year, potentially tens of millions of dollars, could even be on the order of billions of dollars, but I'm not sure if it's quite that high in terms of funding. Mm. So there are, like you wonder where the money comes from to, to fund these vegan ideas and to make these super sexy vegan hand grenades that explode into rainbows and unicorns <laughs> and my little ponies when they're thrown into the, into the masses by the mainstream media. It's crazy. And so where does this money come from? Well, there are 
funding sources behind the scenes that are very powerful. Seventh-day Adventist Church mm -hmm. is one of them. And again, they're sort of of the opinion that meat and libido and vitality in that sense is not who we should be as humans. But when you really look at this, like you said, it, it all starts to fall apart. We realize these, these My Little Ponies prancing around and these fairy tale unicorns are evanescent. There's nothing to them. You, you start to examine them. They just evaporate before your eyes like some AI simulation. Mm -hmm. And I think that the same is true when we actually think about the popularity of a vegan diet. So I was actually here the other day and I was thinking about this and someone asked me, why do you think the plant-based diet or the vegan diet is so popular and that it's growing so much? And I actually don't think it's popular and mm -hmm. growing much at all. I think that the media wants us to believe it is because that's how the fallacy is maintained. Mm -hmm. We must believe that the emperor has clothes. Mm -hmm. But if the emperor has no clothes, if we really start to realize that the vegan diet is not growing in popularity and that there are more people leaving the plant-based movement than there are finding the plant-based movement, we have a big problem if, uh, with the narrative from the plant-based movement. Not, we have a, not really a problem from the health perspective of humans, but yeah. I actually don't think a plant-based diet is that popular with humans anymore. Mm. I think we are really propagandized. We're programmed to believe it is because that's, what, that's how we get people to join it. If, if everyone else is doing it, Steve, man, if there's a line of people at the plant-based burger joint, there's something good over there. Mm -hmm. But I just don't believe that's true. If you talk to the grocery store managers, they'll tell you not, you don't even have to probe that much. The plant-based meats don't sell that no. well. They're the worst selling things in the grocery store. I think they're there from an optics perspective. But when was the last time you went to a grocery store and saw someone loading up their cart with impossible burgers? I go to grocery stores all the time. I get in trouble for filming there sometimes, but I just don't see it that much. Mm -hmm. But if you listen to the media, it's happening. And it's just, you see all these celebrities supporting mm -hmm. it and people coming on board and saying, this is the best thing. This is what you should be eating. It's better for the planet. Like you said, all of this boilerplate rhetoric with mm -hmm. nothing behind it, you know, fairy tale unicorn, you know, pronouncements, which are just propaganda. But I actually think that we should examine this and question it and question the media and fact check them because I don't think it's growing. Yeah. If I talk to people, and again, my network is confirmation bias, but even when I talk to people outside of my network, I don't think it's growing. Mm -hmm. I think that almond milk and fake plant milks, okay, you convinced a few people with their smoothies, probably because of lactose intolerance, mm -hmm. and we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the meats and the whole vegan movement, I think it's dying because I think that we're doing good work in the world and people are beginning to understand that the arguments don't hold merit. Mm -hmm. And people, all someone has to do is return to eating meat and they feel so much better and they understand it just clicks for them and they cannot deny that. They can't deny how much more vital, how much more you know, virile, how much more libido they have when they begin to incorporate more animal foods, meat and organs. And sometimes when they incorporate less of these plant mm -hmm. foods, especially this hyper-processed plant foods. So this is so interesting to me. I think it's a, I think it's a psyop in some ways. Mm -hmm. I think it's propagandized psyop, but who's supporting it? Seventh-day Adventists, probably pharmaceutical companies. We know that there's a lot of profit to be made in these plant-based companies. There's a lot of margin mm -hmm. there. There's not a lot of margin in spinach. Mm -hmm. There's not a, not a lot of margin in tomatoes, not a lot of margin in steaks. There's a lot of margin in impossible sausages. <laughs> so we must tell the people, we must get them to believe a certain thing. And if anyone doubts the ability of the media to do that, consider the last three to yes. three years. <laughs> End of story. End, <laughs> End of story. Of yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty wild when you consider other... I guess convenient or inconvenient facts, however you want to phrase them. But you know, people like Bill Gates becoming the largest owner of farmland in Scary. the United States, and he's certainly not using that farmland and going to push regenerative agriculture. Right? He doesn't want to do that. They want to push this, and again, it begs the question: Is this purely financial because of the markups? Is this purely like we can feed more people this way? Which we'd argue that you can't because eventually you're going to burn out those systems. And or, or lastly, is it something else? Like, you know, not to get too conspiratorial, but I often wonder. Like to me, vegan versus like an animal based, there's, there's a difference in vitality. There's almost like a predator versus prey mentality. And you see other attacks in our culture through the media. You see attack on freedom and sovereignty. You see attack on meat. You see this push to plant based. You see this attack on masculinity. You, you, you take out the, the legs of the chur that provide strength and this fundamental grounded energy and you take them out. And all of a sudden, what you're left with is people that are easy to control, people that are weak, people that will listen to everything that comes from the media, which plays beautifully into their game. So my question is, what do you think it is? Why is it? Is it purely profit driven? Is there something else going on? Do we not know? And what's the, what's the spidey sense tingling for you, Paul? I don't know. 
I just don't know. It's I, it's definitely profit driven. Yeah. Unquestionably. Now, there is so much apparent collusion between the political the political background of all mm -hmm. these things, right? It it all fits together so well mm -hmm. that I can't imagine there's not something going on behind the scenes. The fact that there's this really in the face of massive amounts of contradictory evidence, this push over and over this resounding wave that cows are bad for the planet, that animal agriculture is bad for the planet. It's just not a complete story. Mm -hmm. And so many things now are being are being leveraged around climate change. And that's scary it's to me. Big one. It's a big one. And so you can't say anything that's against climate change. And then if you just look at the science there, it's much more complicated than we imagine. I mean, look at the work of Michael Schellenberger, yeah. look at the work of, of um, Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson. Yeah. Like there's so much there bringing this into question. Is this really what's happening? How much of an impact are humans truly having? No, I don't like driving behind a diesel mm -hmm. truck and breathing the exhaust, but how much impact are we really having? We really need to be able to have the conversations. That's the scariest thing to me. And that's probably what makes me think there's something going on yes. beneath the surface when you can't even have the conversation. Yeah. Whether it's about climate change, everyone knows the science is settled. Mm. What what a what a morbid thing to say. You know, what a gosh, that is such an unappealing, unattractive thing to hear. The science is settled. We know. We understand this completely. Are you kidding me? Yeah. So that's a crazy thing to me that it's it's all kind of built on this, again, this apparent solid foundation. The science is settled. We know cows are harming the planet. I mean, look at the look at the pronunciations of Eric Adams, the mayor of New York City, saying, We know that mm -hmm. plant-based diets are better for your body and better for the environment. Mm -hmm. And I think, wow, mm -hmm. I don't think it's gonna age well. You know, don't everyone record that clip and play it back to him in 10 years when we when we can say, actually, you were you were bold face lying. Yes. We do not know that. Yeah. We do not know that a plant-based diet is better for the environment. In fact, we have much evidence to the contrary. And we certainly don't know that a plant-based diet is better for our bodies. Mm -hmm. So the, the way that it's all connected beneath the surface and the way that some of these conversations are censored and not allowed to be talked about, meta completely removing a post that is historically true as far as I can tell at every source that I look at, mm -hmm. that suggests to me there's something going on. Now, what you say is completely true. I think human behavior changes when we are nutrient full or nutrient depleted? And is it possible that somewhere people are saying, we want people to be easier to control with less nutrients? It is, I don't want to believe that's true. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I hope it's not true. I certainly believe that there's a profit-driven thing going on and whether or not there's a deeper motive is questionable. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I think we should be aware of it. And you said something else that I wanna to touch on before we move away from this. Did you see that James Cameron, the director of Avatar, yeah. Terminator? Testosterone is a toxin that must be eradicated from young men. And mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's convenient, right? That sounds like a, something a Seventh-day Adventist adherent like what we started with, right? yes. would say. And all respect to all religious traditions, but that sounds like something, someone in a religious tradition that was vehemently opposed mm -hmm. to libidinous desires, to vitality, to beautiful sexuality for humans would say. Mm -hmm. And that's super scary. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, people may know this, he's also made a $140 million investment into verdient foods, which makes pea protein, mm. which is the component of so many plant proteins. So in some ways you could look at, I think there should be a stamp on plant protein. James Cameron approved yeah. lowers testosterone. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm obviously taking a few editorial liberties here, but yeah. If we, if you know, John Harvey Kellogg approved lower <laughs> testosterone, like cornflakes. <laughs> and not Terminator approved, because you're talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime, the most testosterone of every man ever. Now, right. James Cameron produced that movie, and now that's a, a bad thing after making him, you know, tens of millions of dollars. Yeah, and I mean, I don't think it's a, it's approved by any of the movies he's no. made. I mean, Avatar is about connection with the environment. Mm. And think of the irony there. Like, when I watch Avatar, I think that's the jungle. That mm -hmm. looks like where I live in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of animals living in the jungle. We're not eliminating animals. And there's there's no, show me the part in Avatar where they're monocrop agriculture, yeah. <laughs> right? And like the Navi are growing plants in monocrop agriculture. Mm -hmm. Like where's the pea protein field in, Ava in Avatar? Absolutely. So like, you know, James Cameron approved, John Harvey Kellogg approved, lowers testosterone. Yeah. You know, will quell your libido just mm -hmm. fine. Thumbs up. Wonderful. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. It, do you know what's so interesting to me as well about, because I, I know vegans personally, and I'm, I'm friendly, I have friendly dialogues with these people all the time. And it's interesting because usually they're, um, 
they're not just hook, line, and sinker buying all the narratives. They're actually usually quite curious. They start to ask questions about things. They start to have a little bit of their spidey sense tingling about the standard advice around certain things. But for whatever reason, the standard advice around diet, that red meat, cholesterol bad, saturated fat bad, and veganism good is one that just doesn't get, it just gets through the bullshit meter for whatever reason. And it's just curious to me because it's like, they're almost the, and it's just like they took one wrong turn down this particular aisle, but it's just that one slips through the cracks for some reason. The science is hard. It's hard to understand. Mm. It's complex, right? And again, then we have to think about what is the media saying to humans? What do we see in the media day in and day out? Yeah, right. You never see a study that says replacing 200 grams of carbohydrates from grains every day with eight ounces of lean red meat leads to decreased inflammatory markers. But that's a published study from yeah. 2016. Yeah. You never see studies showing that. I mean, I I didn't I wish this study had been on CNN or Fox News, but you know, obese adolescent girls, 13 to 15, eating a breakfast of a high protein breakfast of meat and eggs versus cereals, oatmeal, cereal, whatever. It's very clear that the high protein breakfast of beef and eggs results in improved satiety, less snacking later in the day, changes in the neurochemistry mm. that are connected with satiety and ease of weight loss, because that's the healthy way to lose weight, right? Mm. To be satiated, to not always be craving something and forcing yourself not to eat it. But wait, beef and eggs lead to more weight loss than a cereal breakfast. When was the last time you saw that on CNN? Yeah. So there's a lot of selective reporting. So if you are plugged into the mainstream media, I almost said the matrix, but I, <laughs> if you're plugged into mainstream media and that's where you get your news, you're, you're only getting a certain amount of mm -hmm. information. You're not even gonna see the literature out there and how would you know? Mm -hmm. Unless you're digging every single day into PubMed and who does this, who has time? Everyone has lives. How are you going to know these things, these contradictory ideas? There's plenty in the mainstream media that's been parroted over and over and over around the benefits of plants. Mm -hmm. But when we examine those, how well do those studies hold up to scrutiny? And what does it mean? What does the study actually mean? Mm -hmm. Is it just an observational epidemiology study? And could it be confounded by things like healthy user bias, mm -hmm. which is a fancy term that means, well, potentially in the study, people who are eating more plants might be more likely to play tennis on Sundays, yep. to get in the sun, to go for a walk, to have colonoscopies and mammograms, yep. to see their doctor more frequently, to be of a higher socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. And the flip side is also true. And this is the problem with these observational studies when it comes to the question of meat versus plants. What are the people who are eating meat doing, mm -hmm. right? They're potentially smoking and drinking beer, eating brownies at a barbecue. I mean, when was the last time you went to a barbecue and saw someone just eating? Yeah. I mean, your barbecues might be different, right? Yeah. But just the, the average barbecue, when was the last time anyone listening to this went to the average barbecue, right? Not, not people who are really clued into the things we're talking about and saw someone just eating a steak or a piece of meat. No, when was the last time you went to McDonald's, which is perhaps even a better example, mm -hmm. and saw someone just getting a plain burger patty? You're not with your friends, right? Or anyone who's cued into this message. Like, no one does that. These meats associate with foods that could have potentially negative effects. Mm -hmm. We know that people are eating meat with coleslaw. What's in the coleslaw? Seed oils, processed sugar, high fructose corn syrup. What's in the brownie? Who knows, you know? Gluten, high fructose corn syrup, dyes. What's in the Coca-Cola? High fructose corn syrup, caramel color. The list goes on and on and on and on. And so it's this is the problem with these observational studies, but those are what, are reported. Those are what gets reported by the mm. mainstream media and that shapes people. Mm. So I think one of the most important questions for all of us to ask is how much of the opinions of the beliefs that we hold are from research that we've done ourselves, that we've actually read the studies and done our due diligence. And I'm sure that I have, I know that I have my blind spots, mm -hmm. right? I'm not a particularly political person. And so I don't get involved in it. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of stay to the side and I know that if I'm going to have a conversation who's some, with someone who's really interested in politics, I might say, hey man, I don't really know the details here. What can you teach me? Yeah. But how many of our health ideas, which is kind of the, the, the genre of this podcast, are formed by what we have looked at, what we have researched and really examined foundationally versus what has been given to us, what has been foisted upon us, mm -hmm. how much have we been programmed versus what do we actually really have the the courage to examine ourselves. There's a big difference there. Yeah, there's a huge difference there. I mean, you said so much there. I, like one of the points you, you made, which I think is an interesting segue as well, is that 
the, the plant-based movement seems also to be a position of privilege, a certain level of privilege. It's often the coastal elites, busy cities. They can fly in the acai from Peru and the bananas from this place and that place. And, you know, they can construct these beautiful looking, you know, plates. Whereas the, the people in more food deserts that are relying on backyard chickens and the local cows seem to get left behind in that conversation. Maybe that's a chicken and egg scenario where, well, that's where the money is. So that's where the funding goes. So that's where the science comes from. So that creates the echo chamber and on and on we go. But in a sense, what would be your assumption of, aren't we all, globally speaking, looking at the Western diet already on a plant-based diet? I mean, if you look at the trends in terms of beef consumption, down, 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 we do see chicken going up, which again would have issues with the poofer content of that and what's feeding that. But beef is one of our favorite foods, ruminant animals. And that trend is going downwards. And we see the calorie increase from things like seed oils and vegetables and grains just skyrocketing. So in a sense, you could argue we're already on a plant-based diet. And to close that loop, the experiment that we are seeing that everybody's living is, are we getting healthier or are we getting less healthy? And I think that it's pretty obvious that we're getting less healthy. Yeah, if you look at the trends of consumption of meat overall, um, meat is going up a little bit, but you said it's mostly accounted for by chicken, yeah. white meat, which isn't something that many people point to in the literature as being harmful for humans. This is a separate discussion, but red meat is going down. Mm -hmm. And I think that most humans consume the majority of their calories from plants mm -hmm. and plant-based foods. And as you said, that is resulting, or that is correlated, right? Concomitant with that, tracking along with that is worsening obesity, increased rates of diabetes, increased rates of mood disorders, you know, mental health, autoimmune conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, thyroid, hormone disruption, infertility. I mean, I did some research recently and looked at infertility rates. Mm. It's crazy to think about. It's very scary. And I know here at Heart and Soil, you guys did this Nourish documentary, mm -hmm. which was so well done. Props to the crew. And th this is a very, very big problem. Um, similarly, along the same vein, I've seen my friend Tucker Goodrich ask the question mm -hmm. on Twitter because our consumption of seed oils is going up. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to the arguments from Harvard at all uh, around seed oils, they would say, oh, these polyunsaturated omega-6 oils, specifically this oil called linoleic acid, these are heart healthy mm -hmm. because they lower LDL cholesterol, which is a complex discussion we get into. And so that's going up. But so is heart disease mm -hmm. and bad cardiovascular outcomes and diabetes and metabolic dysfunction. So Tucker has appropriately asked, how much of the seed oils do we have to eat? Yeah. We're, we're eating, you know, indigenous cultures, the Hadza, the Ikung, the Khoisan, uh, the Samburu, essentially undiagnosed cardiovascular disease when they're examined. No, no noticeable chronic mm -hmm. disease at all, really, in these populations. They're eating 1% linoleic acid, 2% linoleic acid in their diet from mostly animal fat. There's a small amount mm -hmm. of this fatty acid in animal fat, but not much. As westernized humans, we're at 12, 13, mm. 14% of linoleic acid. And as I've spoken about in my sort of educational stuff in the past, there's probably a threshold across which there isn't really a clear you know, problem with more seed oils, but once you cross the threshold, and we see this in lab animals, once lab animals have more than five or 6% of linoleic acid in their diet, they start to really go downhill fast. Mm. There may not be a huge difference between five and 10. Mm. It's like once you cross the threshold over which the human body can't really process this, this linoleic acid and these seed oils, there appear to be metabolic problems at a lot of levels. Mm. But Tucker has asked, how much of these seed oils do we have to eat before it starts making us healthy? Because we're just eating more and more yeah. and our cardiovascular disease is getting worse and worse and worse. And the same thing we could say is how many whole grains, you know, I'll talk to the US government with their recommendations, like how many servings of whole yeah. grains do we need to eat before our health gets better? Because all we're doing is eating whole grains. And I guess you could say also processed grains as well. But like, how many plants do we have to eat before we get healthier? Yes. And how, you know, how little beef or how much, you know, like how much do we have to get rid of meat? The vegans would say completely, but we know, as we hinted at earlier in the podcast, that there is sort of this trajectory. And this is an interesting thing physiologically to think about. Two to three years, maybe four to five is kind of the lifespan of any vegan. Yeah. And there are outliers, and we can talk about what I think is going on there, but the majority of people that I've spoken to, and I've had so many ex-vegans on my podcast, three to four years, and then things really start Boom. to fall apart. And it's not pretty. It's actually really scary. It's infertility. Mm -hmm. It's mood issues. It's libido. It's autoimmune conditions. It's skin things. And so what's going on there? It's mm -hmm. crazy to think about. Yeah, it is super interesting. And and, and I guess the way we bridge this gap and try to um, 
like what we're, what we're not trying to do here is probably one of the mistakes that get made a lot in these echo chambers is is othering the crew. You'll see a meme. You've been part of these memes because not by your fault, but you'll be pictured in, look at these carnivore docs, look at these animal-based docs, and they look good and they're strong and they're healthy and look at these vegan doctors and they look like melted candles. And you don't convince anybody of anything by kind of othering them or making them feel silly. I think conversations like this are genuinely helpful to just point out the obvious flaws. And the point that you made there, which you see a lot of recovery stories um, from vegans coming to something more like an animal-based diet is just growing rapidly. You don't see much of that going the other way. You don't see anybody thriving. I can't say anybody, but you see very few people thriving on animal-based diet going, oh, I feel amazing. Let me go feel more amazing on a vegan diet and how that works out. You know, it's just it's such an interesting little flip. I mean, I don't think, I don't know if I've ever heard a story of somebody having four or five years on an animal-based diet and saying, oh, then I started to feel bad. Yeah. You know, I wasn't eating enough spinach, so I started yeah. to feel badly. Uh, it's when I was, you know, over the course of my social media, I've joked, you know, polyphenol deficiency or mm -hmm. vegetable deficiency. It, the first one is not as accurate now because I'm eating some fruit with some mm -hmm. polyphenols, whatever. But like, I have a really bad kale deficiency right now. Yes. Still. You know, <laughs> you pick it, you know, like whatever veg, I have a serious vegetable deficiency right now. It's five years in the making. And even before that, I wasn't eating that many vegetables, but it's, you know, where, where are the people who have vegetable deficiency or in a cratering? Mm -hmm. It doesn't really exist like it does with meat and organs. And there's so much scientific literature that's quite technical to explain why mm -hmm. these unique nutrients found in meat and organs that are not found in the plant kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there's a there's a real disconnect there. And it's not, it doesn't look, there's not a lot of parody. It's definitely skewed. But there are examples of people, to be fair, there are examples of people who are thriving on a plant-based yeah. diet. And I think this is important to consider. And I think that a lot of people when they go plant-based, they cut out junk food. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. A vegan diet is better than your yeah. junk food, standard American diet. Any intentional choice with your diet is better. That's great. Yeah. You're going to feel better, undoubtedly. You might lose weight, right? That's fantastic. But what will it look like long-term and where are you getting these nutrients? Carnitine, choline, vitamin K2, B12, peptides that are uniquely found mm. in animal foods. I mean, the list is so long, you cannot make a multivitamin because we are not even aware. We are discovering new nutrients in animal foods all the time that are mm -hmm. not found in plant foods. We're discovering new peptides. We're discovering new growth factors that really only occur in animal foods. How You can't make a vitamin to support that. Now, someone could make the same argument and say, hey, we're discovering new things in plant foods. And I would argue, I think that case is a little harder to mm -hmm. make than the animal foods. And that's mm -hmm. a separate conversation. I think that from everything I've seen, Many of these so-called phytochemicals are plant defense chemicals mm -hmm. rather than things that are essential for humans. And what we know is that as we're eating animals, if you're eating a single cow, right, that's one life that's been raised on a field, hopefully in a regenerative fashion, that's eating grass like white oak pastures, super green grass with dirt that's dark like coffee with worms and bugs in it and birds flying around. And you're eating an animal from an ecosystem, that animal is full of nutrients. And we even know that some of those compounds in plants end up in the animal's meat. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a much more difficult thing to make the argument that you're not getting these unique nutrients in plants, but it's pretty clear that if you avoid the animals, you're missing out on very important things for yes. humans. And that we see that over time. And so first off, yes, getting rid of the, the processed foods, that's going to result in an improvement in your health. I'm glad that you're making an intentional choice. That's fantastic. Now, long-term, what happens, like we said, I think that so many people end up with issues three to four years down the road. You hear mm -hmm. the story over mm -hmm. and over. My friend is vegan. He or she is just so committed to the cause. Awesome. I'm impressed that they won't open their mind. Mm -hmm. That's not a good thing. But there are a few examples of outliers. There's people in the space who say, I've been vegan my whole life and mm -hmm. they're 35 years old or they're 50 years old. There's not a lot of them though. Yeah. You think about the number of people who eat meat and are thriving, there's thousands yeah. of influencers, right? I can think of maybe five to 10 vegan influencers who are long-term vegans who look good. And I can think of the same number of very popular vegan influencers whose health has cratered yeah. and they've gone back to eating meat. But of these five to 10 healthy, handsome, beautiful vegan influencers who are still vegan supposedly, I just wonder that the, the statistic, then I think there's something going on beneath the surface and I'll be conspiratorial here. My suspicion is that they're sneaking meat on the side, mm -hmm. right? That they're, and I've heard this from people. And again, this is going to sound crazy. So take it for what it is. Again, I can't confirm this, but you hear fishermen in Alaska saying, you know, I, I ship salmon to mm -hmm. these prominent vegans sometimes. And they won't tell you their names, but I think this is happening. And I wonder if some of these people are saying, well, it's, I'm still vegan if I eat fish once a week, right? Yes. Or, you know, I'm, I'm going to 
you know, do this extra hormone or this extra peptide or you know, these things, or I'm going to take this supplement without telling anyone. And I think that I just, I wonder, I hope that they're really being honest. Mm. And perhaps there are some humans who can thrive on a vegan diet long-term. But in my mind, if that is true, then we have to talk to the zoologist because we have a whole new species of human. Yeah. That's not even homo sapiens. We yeah. evolved eating meat. Eating meat made us human, I yeah. believe strongly. And other historians have corroborated this. Like our human species would, I think there's such strong evidence for that, never have become who we are, homo erectus, homo habilis, homo sapiens, without the unique nutrients, the, the fatty nutrients, the fat soluble nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals found in meat and organs when we became prolific hunters. Mm. So it's just, how do you, how do you go back from that, mm -hmm. right? To say like this made us human, but now there are some humans who have never eaten any meat for 30 years and they're thriving. We've got a new species here. This yeah. is, this is, this is homo erect. This is this like homo sapiens veganus and perhaps it exists, <laughs> but I'm not convinced, Vegan. man. <laughs> it's super interesting, man. And that point you made about like the influencers potentially doing things on the side, it, th that, it can be a cruel community to come out because, you know, it's very uh, cruel. One of the influences that's come into mind recently is a girl called Yoga Girl, and she's got a million and a half followers. And she was a huge vegan proponent for a long time. And recently she came out and basically said the same thing. Now, she was vegan for a long time. I think she made it, you know, eight or nine years, which is a really long stretch. But basically said, look, guys, I loved everything that this stood for. My health started to deteriorate. I'm back to eating animal products and I'm crying with joy at how good I feel. And instead of people celebrating her health, it was just this denigration and attack of her. And, you know, you're spreading this dangerous message now. So I can see potentially this audience capture of these huge vegans who now they they know they see this stuff happening and they have to sneak it on the side. And that's disingenuous. And it's it's obviously not ideal. But I think it also points at one more point to that, which is you you you, you made the point earlier that people really the average person isn't paying any attention to what they eat in the diet, really. They're not paying attention to micronutrients or macronutrients. They're just eating whatever comes. Now, if they remove, because of this plant-based agenda, probably the only food that's got some real usable nutrition in it, like eggs and the beef and the milk, and they go plant-based, and they're still paying no attention, they have just set themselves up for rampant micronutrient, macronutrient inadequacies, you name it. And the ones that are being able to maybe thrive five years plus are also doing so because they can spend hundreds of dollars a month on lab work, blood work, special supplements, maybe even Mexican supplements like testosterone and peptides, like you may have said. So is it possible to do it? Of, of course. But is it possible or realistic for the average normal human to do it who doesn't have that element of resources and time? Probably not so. And then you remove the meat and now you're going to run into problems. And it's misleading. And that's Very. kind of been the theme of this podcast. Like, what is the truth in advertising? What is the media saying? What are these influencers saying? That's that's frustrating for me. And I get it. I mean, I was, I mean, like, let's just own it. I'll just own it. Like you said in the beginning, we we sort of, you know, my social media team and I kind of changed the branding around what I'm doing. I'm yeah. now Paul Saladino MD. I've always been Paul Saladino MD, but for a long time I thought, let's take up this moniker, yeah. Carnivore MD right? I'm a doctor that believes in meat and a diet that's mostly meat is carnivore. And even when I started adding fruit back to my diet, I felt like it was reasonable. But as I'm moving on to doing other things, I want to build a documentary this year. I want to talk about yes. diets that include meat and how valuable they can be for humans and highlight stories. I didn't want to be limited by any moniker that could be thought of as dogmatic, yeah. right? And so that was an interesting change for me. But as I even transitioned from the carnivore community, quote unquote, which can get a little dogmatic yeah, big time. to eating fruit, I got pushback. Big time. It's not people in the carnivore community celebrating me and saying, Paul says he's feeling better, right? His muscles are more full. He's sleeping better. He has no muscle cramps, right? Yeah. He's it's your carb addiction instead yeah, it's or my, something. Yeah. Yeah. He's not having palpitations. All of these things that I was authentic about that mm -hmm. were an issue for me mm -hmm. along my journey as I'm course correcting without carbohydrates in my, in my, in my diet, I'm getting the same pushback. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. And I understand why people don't want to do that. I just yeah. hope that they have the courage to do it because so many people are looking to them for guidance and it's so misleading when someone is saying, I'm doing great on a vegan diet yeah. and they're, they're putting hamburger or a little bit of beef liver or some salmon in their mouth on the side. It's just so many people are suffering because of that. It's yeah. really not good. Yeah, and it, I think that's a, a really cool point to encourage people to question the veracity of their thoughts and their identities. Like if you 
chose that, you know, carnivorism was your hill to die on. And you started to even mm. gaslight yourself out of these things you were feeling because, no, this has to be right. Look at all I've put into it. I feel like that can happen for a lot of plant-based dieters. Again, the heart is in the right place. They've been potentially fed some misleading information and they might be watching similar things that happened to you where they know deep down something's not right. My digestion is off. My libido is gone. My hair is falling out. But they're so wedded to the cause because it became a part of their identity that they can't just say, you know what, I need to change something. And because you've been on that journey, what piece of advice would you offer to someone that's in that position to be willing to understand that, look, it's it's okay to evolve. It's okay to upgrade your thinking and change your mind. That people will respect you more, mm. right? That, that humans appreciate authenticity and honesty. And we're really good. Most humans have a pretty darn good bullshit detector. We can tell when things are kind of bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. We can tell when people are misleading us or being a little shilly or something, it's, it's strange. But the people that I talked to, I mean, the same tech entrepreneur that I knew from Costa Rica said to me, like, when you added fruit to your diet, I, my, my respect for you went up. Yeah. And, and this is someone that was introduced to me from his friends who were benefiting from a strictly carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. And he said, I thought I could trust you when you said, that you changed your mind. Mm -hmm. So that's, everyone knows, everyone has this subjective experience. We've all made mistakes. We've all changed our minds. And this is a real audience capture thing. And so this is another reason that I changed my social media handles and mm -hmm. wanted to kind of rebrand. It ended up being kind of a non thing. Nobody said anything. They just, I guess they just realized my name was Paul. But like, why be wedded to a dogma? And I hoped that Carnivore MD would not be dogmatic, but in some ways it is. So let's just be a human that can change and admit when they're wrong and grow and be curious. That's what we're after. Like mm -hmm. it's that's what I hope my work does. It is it inspires people to be curious and learn and think. I've never heard of a study where replacing grain-based carbohydrates with red meat improves inflammatory markers. I've never heard of a study where adolescent obese women eating a breakfast of meat and eggs did better from a weight loss perspective than eating oatmeal or cereal. Like, let me go look that stuff mm. up. Maybe there's more there. I want to give people the beginning of a thread to pull mm -hmm. on and do their own stuff and to be curious. But people respect truthfulness and authenticity. That's a hugely valuable thing. Yeah, it's massive, man. And I guess the, 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 the kind of closing point before we get into some callers here would be what what is your motivation now? You've obviously, you're building this audience, you're spreading this message, you're giving people that thread to pull on. You've got the supplement line, Heart and Soil, doing incredible things probably not even fair to call them supplements, the real food in a desiccated form. You continue to just produce content and just give and give and give. What is your big hope? Like, what do you hope you can do for this message? Is it to turn the ship around and is it to make radical health the norm again? Like, what's the big kind of audacious goal for Paul at this point? I don't I don't know if I have a big audacious goal. It's like one foot in front of the other, Yeah. right? And it's just every step is meaningful. So let's just keep making steps. When I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail, 2,700 miles from Mexico to Canada in one in one summer. You never think Canada. Mm. You just think, uh, where are we going tonight? Mm. Or wh what what pass am I hiking over now? And so it's never. I don't know that I that I want to change the world in that sense. I hope to do good work in the mm -hmm. world, and if that happens, then great. But what's most important for me is that every step is quality. Right. Mm -hmm. It's almost like um, if you're doing martial arts, right, or you're doing uh surfing you're not really thinking about the last turn you're going to do on the wave or you're not thinking about how you're going to submit someone in a in a like jujitsu can competition or something you're thinking about how to improve your position at one step at a time right i think that these end goals i don't really think about that stuff mm -hmm. i think what's in, what's exciting for me now what feels impactful for me now what are people finding valuable? Let's do that and do it as well as possible and just build the most beautiful house we can brick by brick. Yeah. And and who knows what it's going to look like, but it's just it's slowly, intentionally with, you know, the most the most care that I can with every step. And of course, I'm going to have missteps, but right, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the most care with every step, that's what's interesting to me um, along the way. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. sometimes having a plan can get you in trouble a little bit, I right? think it can because yeah. then if, what if, what if things are not, yeah. you know, there, yeah. right? Like what if, the universe or the earth, you know, what if the world, whatever spiritual thing we're thinking of that's yeah. bigger than us in any way, sense or form, what if that's not really what's part of it? What's right? planned, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what and I think what's what's important there is that then, like you said, almost like in the dance of life, in, in Buddhism, they call it Leela. It's a, literally the dance of life. And sometimes you are leading and sometimes you're getting led and sometimes you're getting smacked over the head. <laughs> yeah. So it's not necessary that every step is perfect and everything is well thought out. It's that you are directionally correct with each iteration and that if you make a mistake, you own it and then you pivot back and you follow something 
that's inside almost like an internal guidance system that gets into the spiritual realms of like what is this thing what is this muse what is this creative force so in in you've done so many interviews at this point and you've talked you know so much about healthy habits and and food and sleep what what is what is that for you what keeps you connected to that what, what helps you stay grounded do you have like an introspective practice do you meditate do you do you journal a lot do you write or do you just do you just live more as like a kind of just a, a, a living practice do you have anything there i think that the things that i enjoy in my free time are introspective hmm. being in jungle hiking swimming in rivers Surfing is very introspective. Mm -hmm. It's you in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a friend there, but it's a lot of introspection. It's a lot of quiet, a lot of disconnection. So those things are introspective. I always try to cultivate some sort of introspective practice. I have varying levels of success with that yeah. personally. But yeah, I, I like quiet. I like nature. I like wilderness. I like being disconnected from distracting things. And there's a lot of introspection there. It's the quiet is when the real magic happens, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, but the birthplace of genius is boredom a lot of the time. Yeah. And it's so funny to think we could even be bored in nature because it's so fascinating when you reconnect. Like I don't live in the jungle in Costa Rica, but I live in the deep countryside of Tennessee and I don't have any neighbors. I'm on a dead end road. I have animals and trees. And I even feel when I come to Austin or Dripping Springs yeah. that there's a different energy. And I feel like you probably experience in that out on the water every day, connected to this huge sink of ions and nature and the jungle. And I think there's some there's some wisdom in that. I think like that that ability to be still and to go inward in a world that is everything pulling you outward, especially as you get bigger and more famous and more opportunities and come on this podcast, Paul, and come do this. You've got to probably be able to say no and protect that sacred space of going in as well so that when you say yes to something, you can really go all in, come in, hustle for a couple of weeks and then retreat back to that. Ah, okay, now I can think, now I can be a human again. This crazy idea of we're a human being, not a human doing. And our culture is just so much Rah, go. <laughs> distraction in a huge huge way absolutely I, I i wouldn't even call it boredom mm -hmm. so i went on this meditation retreat many years ago with the shambhala which is a tibetan buddhist mm -hmm. tradition and their one of their adages was entertainment boredom peace mm -hmm. that you had to move through boredom to find peace and i thought boredom is just me withdrawing from overstimulation mm -hmm. but very quickly or perhaps more quickly than each of us imagine, we become peaceful. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I would say peace, which isn't quite as, you know, viral a saying as boredom is the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, you know, sort of the, the incubator of genius, but I think peace, you know, quiet, mm. because boredom is such a negative mm -hmm. term. It's, yes. like a, it's a restless type of energy. Um, you know, if, if you, I'm, as much as I try, I'm still addicted to my phone. Yes. And if my phone is broken or, the few times it's gotten stolen when I'm traveling, you think, oh, there's a restlessness here. But and that that feels like boredom or something. But it's it's the moving through that yes. that that the magic happens when you're peaceful in those situations, like quiet yeah. and peace. I think that's the incubator. That's the vessel of genius. Yeah, you know what was really I I just came back from a trip to England and Spain. And because I'm on an American cell phone plan, my phone didn't work unless I was connected to Wi-Fi. So I would go out and take a walk, I'll be in social situations and for the first couple of days, I felt my hand going for my phone and then the reminder that, oh, this doesn't work anyway. So there was that initial agitation and like, let me check the DMs or whatever, see what's going on with the world. And then I moved through that. And then I got to this peacefulness where it's like, oh, this is actually really nice. You know, this is really nice. And Naval said that um, peace is happiness at rest. And that's what you're describing. It's it's boredom is just the word that we probably more understand now because we're so stimulated and go, go, go all the time. You can't even sit in a grocery store line for five seconds without having a quick flick, right? So this being able to be with self and to be in peace is happiness at rest. And I guess a, a closing question for you is, what are you happy now like with the, with all of this abundance in life how does how does happiness factor into the equation of what you do do you just find yourself grateful and happy to wake up every day doing what you do spreading a great message surfing every now and then eating delicious foods it's a good life man it's a good life <laughs> yeah it's a good life i'm pretty happy i, I think i'm happiest in nature mm -hmm. sharing experiences with friends mm -hmm. and i don't get to do that all the time right so sometimes i'm in a grocery store getting told that I can't film. Yeah. <laughs> Put a shirt on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't, I, 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 you I mean, don't do that anymore. Yeah, I, I know. I wear a shirt a lot now. I mean, the physique is still the same underneath. Trust me. If you guys watch my Instagram, you can you can find the stories if you want the full reveal. Like, you can see me shirtless <laughs> sometimes. It's still the same underneath. But uh, it's, yeah. So 
I don't get to do the things that make me the happiest all the time, but yeah. I, I always feel like the work is meaningful. Yes. And I think I get up every day and, and have intention and enthusiasm to do the work. I, I never get up and think, all right, another day of content or another day of what am I going to do? That It's always interesting. So that's yeah. great. I think that I would prefer to be in nature with friends doing something interesting, but I, I, I like and I, I find joy and meaning in, in making content that I think is going to help people. So yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. To come full circle yeah. on the whole cult, maybe that's the next step in Paul's uh, Costa Rican cult. You get all your friends out there and you guys can just frolic and play in the <laughs> oh, sand me, and I'm trying to get all my day. friends out there. I'll, I'll come, man. You, send, trying, you yeah. send the invite. I'll yeah. be a friend. <laughs> yeah. Before we move on, I wanted to show you this. So yeah, I brought you this it? gift. So this is, so when I was in a grocery store trying not to get kicked out, this is back to our discussion about veganism. So this is the meatless Korean barbecue ribs. I think mm. this is a good illustration of what we've been talking about in the house of cards here. Meatless Korean barbecue ribs ingredients from Central Market. There are no less than 95 ingredients on this list. <laughs> you can see, I don't know if you guys can see in the thing here, Whoa. the whole list there are the ingredients of Korean barbecue ribs. Seed oils, vital weak gluten. I don't know what's vital about weak gluten. <laughs> you know, soy sauce, corn, canola, soybean, all sorts of 95 ingredients into a vegan meat product that's mimicking a meat that you're craving in the deep regions of your brain because we're programmed to do this. It's crazy. I think, that, again, the intention is good, but I hope that, I just hope that if people are plant based and they're listening to this or know people who are plant based, I, I hope that we've come at this with compassion and kindness, but also with the courage to expose the, a little bit of the craziness of this movement. Yeah, I, I agree, man. I couldn't have said it better to wrap up. That's exactly what it is. It's not about trying to make people feel silly or say, ah, oh, you know, we're right, you're wrong. It's just we care about health. And we see that this health thing going down that route and chasing these meats, everything's named after meats. It's vegan sausage, it's an impossible burger. When the real thing is right there and it's a single ingredient, it's ground beef single or it's Korean short ribs liver. cut that way, <laughs> liver. You know, these foods are there. They are waiting for you and your health is waiting for them. And I just hope that, yeah, like you said, it was it was approached in a way that can bridge the gap because I, I do believe that we've got more in common than we have um, in opposition to one another in terms of these arguments. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, without further ado, it's time to take some callers. So we got three callers on the line today and they are going to shoot you some questions, Paul, and we'll riff on them a little bit and then we'll wrap this baby up. So first on the line today is Lyndall from Utah. And uh, we got a good question here about research studies, which Paul is very versed in. So, Lyndall, hit, hit us with the question. Let us know how we can help you, and we'll see what we've got. Okay. First, let me say thank you for all that you're doing with your time. And I do agree that the authenticity and curiosity matters to people. So thank you for that. Um, my question is, for those of us that are not doctors or professional researchers, when we're looking at at information or research, trying to be curious, what are some productive questions that we can ask or information that we can specifically look at that helps us discern what um, is a bias or can help us discern the integrity or the quality of the study of the, or the findings of the study? This is such a good question. Thank you. It's great to connect with you. I think that there are let's just say three big types of studies that you want to think about when you're looking at research. And if you can put the study into one of these three buckets, it'll help you understand what you're looking at. So the first type of study is an interventional study where people are gathered and sometimes these are blinded, but there, there's some intervention. They're given a pill, they're given a supplement, they're given a food, something is taken away, something is actually done. Those are the type of studies that get me the most curious because it's actually an experiment. Something is done. They have to be controlled. And we want to do a study like that with an animal-based diet soon. I think it's going to happen at Utah State University with Stefan Van Vliet. So stay tuned for this, guys. But we want to do a pilot randomized controlled study with an animal-based diet versus a plant-based diet versus a standard diet when it comes to autoimmune conditions. And that's what we're going to do there is take three groups of people, probably 20 in each group, and we're going to feed each group a different set of foods. There's an intervention there. We're doing something with those people and we're going to watch them. We can't blind that study, meaning they're gonna know what they're eating. The researchers are gonna know what they're eating. But that's what blinding and double blinding means that the participants and, this, and the researchers don't know what's happening, but you were at least controlling it. We're randomizing, which just means that people are randomly assigned to each group 
and then we're controlling it, meaning we're actually doing an intervention. It's an interventional study, and that one will be very interesting. So those are the type of studies that are interesting for me. One type of diet versus another type of diet, one type of supplement, et cetera, et cetera, taking something out. That's an interventional study. Now, there's a lot of nuance within those that you can go further, but let's just talk about the second type of study, which is an observational study, sometimes called observational epidemiology. And the difference between these two is really the difference between the zero yard line and the 75 yard line in a football field. It's just, it's completely different. Um, there's, there's, you know, or I guess there's no 75 yard line in the football field. It's like, you get it like the 25 yard line or the 50 yard line in the football field. I don't watch a lot of sports. You guys get what I'm saying. <laughs> it's embarrassing. Uh, you know, so, but in an observational study, there is no intervention other than a survey. You're watching people over time, but there's nothing being done. You're asking them, how many eggs do you eat for breakfast? How much kale do you eat for breakfast? How many salads do you eat? How much walking do you do? How much time in the sun do you spend? Um, you know, all these things. Do you do you sleep eight hours a night? What, and then and then you're either following them prospectively or you're looking back retrospectively. So you can go back in time or forward in time and you're looking at health outcomes and you can only draw a correlation. And anytime you have that word correlation or association, you have to kind of be a little skeptical and think, hmm, I can't draw causative inference. I, correlation is never causation. So even when I'm talking about associations or observational studies in my work, I'll try to point out this is an observational study. You can't draw you know, causation here, but let's think about what could be going on. As we talked about in this podcast, the really dangerous studies with this generally involve diet because there's so much narrative in our culture around diet. And if you followed any of my work, you know that if you look at observational studies of diet in the West, in the United States versus in the East, in Asia, Thailand, Singapore, Japan, China, they're very different outcomes because there's a very different narrative around meat. Mm. In the Western world, red meat consumption is often, not all the time, but often associated, again, this is an observational study, no experiment, with worse health outcomes. But in the Eastern world, and there's a large study of 230,000 people over many years, red meat consumption is associated with better health outcomes, lower rates of cardiovascular disease in men and lower rates of cancers in women. So what's going on? Is meat better for Asians and not so good for Westerners? No, the most likely thing is that there's a narrative here and the consumption of meat is associated with different things in different cultures. This mm -hmm. is the danger of these type of studies. So in the East, if you go there, red meat is associated with affluence. People that eat meat have money because it's expensive. In the West, red meat is associated with poor behaviors because we've been told that red meat is bad for us for 70 years, probably for longer than that, maybe 100 years. So this is the problem with these observational studies. And then the third type of study is a meta-analysis or a correlation, a collation of multiple studies. And you can have a meta-analysis of interventional studies, or you can have a meta-analysis of observational studies. And if you have a meta-analysis of observational studies, in my mind, this is kind of like a landfill. If it's a bunch of garbage, it doesn't turn into a million dollar condo. Just putting more observational studies together doesn't make those observational studies better quality. This is a main problem I have with a lot of what I see in the plant-based circles. They'll say, they'll say, we need to lean on the weight of the evidence. And they'll say, here's a meta-analysis of 20 observational studies showing that plants are associated with better health outcomes. And you think, like I said, just because you make a bunch of garbage at a pile in your backyard that doesn't magically become a beautiful sculpture or a shed to put your lawn care stuff in or uh, or a tree house for your kids or something really valuable. It's just a bunch of garbage. More garbage is more garbage. A landfill doesn't magically become a million dollar beachside condo in Miami. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem with this. But if you have a meta-analysis of interventional studies, well, you have a lot of good studies together. That's kind of interesting to look at. So you have to understand that oftentimes people will say, this is the highest standard of meta-analysis. But if it's a meta-analysis of lots of poor quality studies, can you really pay much attention to it? I would say no. So hopefully that helps at a, at a high level. And yeah. Oh, sorry, Lindo. I didn't want to interrupt because I don't have too much to add there because Paul just knocked that one out of the park, but also just the invitation for the study on yourself as well, like the the science experiment of how you feel, look and perform and, and trying these different things out. Like take everything that Paul just said, dive into the literature, feel into what feels like it makes the most sense for you and then run the experiment and see if you get healthier and see if you get happier and you have more vitality and just be willing to, like we spoke about today, change your mind if you somehow, you know, maybe went down the wrong 
wrong or incorrect path for you. But I hope that helped, Lindell. That was an amazing question. And thanks for being on the show. And next up, we have Paula from California. Got a question about lipids, HDL and LDL. Paula, tell us the story. What's going on? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. First, I want to say that I'm a huge fan of Paul. You know, like the animal-based diet changed completely my life. I actually thank the Lord Jesus Christ because uh, he put Paul in my way. And just like my health right now is amazing. So my question is, it's been one year I'm on an animal-based diet, and five months I'm strictly on an animal-based diet. So my LDL, less agua, was 132. And then this March 2023 is 205. So my question is, is my LDL is going to keep going up on animal-based diet, or at some point it will get uh, stable, it's stabilized? Yeah, this, the lipids are always an interesting conversation. Thanks for the question, and I'm so glad you're doing better. And I, I love that you've already kind of made this easy for me and framed it in an interesting way. You're feeling good on an animal-based diet. You know, in medicine, it's, it's almost trite to say this, but doctors will know we don't treat the patient, we treat the labs. We're always trying to look for underlying cardiovascular risk. And so we'll, we'll talk about this LDL question, but you're feeling really good on this diet. So the first thing I'm thinking is of is, okay, great. <laughs> like this patient is probably, not that you're a patient, but you know what I mean? Like this human, this person is doing good. This question of LDL is central though, because it's very common for people when they decrease polyunsaturated fats and seed oils, which are in a lot of the processed foods, and increase saturated fats in animal foods, whether it's a fatty burger, butter, whole milk, yogurt, whatever, the LDL may go up. And often it goes up 20 to 30%. But the question is, does that represent any meaningful increase in your cardiovascular disease risk? Or is it just a wash? Or is it a decrease in your cardiovascular disease risk? And the answer to this question is a little more complex than just the LDL. You have to expand your perspective. So you have to think of your whole lipid panel. You can look at triglycerides and HDL. But then in the work that I've done, I've urged people to also look at their fasting insulin, right? Because that's probably the best metric of your metabolic health. And so few doctors are trained to think about LDL in the context of your metabolic health. My suspicion is that over the last year or more, your metabolic health has improved. I don't know if we have that data regarding your fasting insulin, but if your fasting insulin has gone down, we can say your metabolic health has improved. Now, I would aim for a fasting insulin of less than five micro IU per ml. And anytime I'm looking at my LDL or looking at someone else's LDL and thinking about it hypothetically, I think that it always must be interpreted in that context. I think that getting into the weeds just a little bit, there's not really convincing evidence in my mind and in many other people's minds that LDL itself, that low density lipoprotein is atherogenic, that that is a harmful particle for humans. Does it get involved in the repair of the arteries? Can we find it in an arterial wall when there is a plaque or a healing lesion there? Yes. Does that mean that it caused the problem? No. Again, we have to be very careful how we look at this. You have a fire in a building, firemen show up. The firemen are there to put the fire out, right? The arsonist is the person who started the fire. So just because something arrives at an injury in the human body doesn't mean that it's the cause of that injury. And I think in this case, we know very clearly there are other things that start the fire in our arteries. More specifically, it's damage to the inside of the arteries, which is called the endothelium, and then impairments in the repair of that damage. What kind of conditions impair wound healing? Diabetes, metabolic dysfunction. LDL may arrive to those plaques, but I don't think that LDL is causing it. So I think the argument that more LDL is bad is too simplistic and it misses this context, this foundation of metabolic health. Now you asked a question, which is, is my LDL going to continue to go up? I doubt it. I think most people see that increase pretty quickly when they change their diet. And again, the change in LDL is not pathological. LDL is valuable for the human body. LDL is a bus that moves cholesterol and triglycerides to your cells so they can build and grow and repair. Cholesterol in actuality is the backbone of all of your hormones that are steroid hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, pregnenolone, aldosterone, et cetera. This is a valuable piece of building blocks for humans. 
And LDL participates in the immune response. We know that it's involved in something called quorum sensing, which is the sort of co communication between pathogenic bacterial and the human body. And so the LDL molecule gets in the way of that. It sort of grabs onto or adheres to these particles or it inter interferes with the communication between uh, pathogenic bacteria in the human body. So LDL has many beneficial roles. The other thing we could say with a rising LDL is, wow, you have more buses bringing good cargo to your cells. You can do more repair. You can make more hormones. You have more of this particle that participates in an immune response. That's probably healthier for you <laughs> in most situations. And we know that in humans above the age of 60, generally speaking, more LDL is consistently associated with better outcomes because LDL helps us as we age from that, that immune perspective. In the younger people, it's a little confusing with the data because we do get some people who have diabetes who see a rise in LDL, but they're also seeing the rise in LDL as they become metabolically unhealthy. So not every rise in LDL is the same from a cardiovascular perspective or from a cardiovascular risk. I think your LDL will likely plateau at that level. I've even checked my LDL multiple times in the same week or week to week and seen pretty major differences. On my podcast, I've talked about my recent blood work. I did August, November of 2022, and then March of 2023. And in November, my LDL, I think was 134 milligrams per deciliter. And then in uh, March of 2023, I think it was 165 milligrams per deciliter, basically eating the same diet. I just eat meat and organs, fruit, honey, raw dairy. So LDL can also fluctuate based on when you ate the night before, what foods you're eating, how stressed you are, how well you're sleeping. So if you're really interested in it, get it checked a few more times, do fasting, do about the same time. I bet you'll see more fluctuation than you imagine. I wouldn't be surprised if that 205 or 202 is 180 or 160. But the overarching idea here is that LDL is beneficial for people and that the context matters and your metabolic health is the real key determinant thing. Does that answer your question? Yes, Paul, thank you so much. It's great. And I watch all your like YouTube videos and on Instagram. So I'm becoming a pro or animal based diet. Just I'm glad it's please helpful. Please keep spread the great message. Thank you. You know, I'm a huge fan. And also, my mom is on animal based diet and taking my best friends and that's why it's like on the boat. We love you. It's great to hear from you. Thank you so much. Paula, you Thank are you, awesome. Paul. Keep doing it. That's so good to see. And we love your energy. Thanks for calling in. And last but not least, we have Gabriella, also from California, on the phone, who's got a question about one of our personal favorites, Mr. Liver. So, Gabriella, what's the question? What can we help you with? Hi. Thank you guys for having me on. Um, I just had a question. I wanted to know, like, what is raw liver good for? And then I also had another question. Um, my son, he's currently five months, but when I start being able to give him food like when is it appropriate to start giving him like needs and then like him to drink raw milk yeah yeah so the first thing i'll say is um no health advice given on this podcast right <laughs> um but i will i will answer your question i think the tricky thing here with kids and with parents is like you you want to make sure you talk to your doctor mm -hmm. about this my idea is maybe different than your doctor's but then i think that all humans have the agency to make their own decisions so I'll tell you what I would do for my children or what I might advise my sister to do with my niece and nephew. I think that parental decisions for what to feed their children, especially when it comes to raw foods, are very personal. And I want to respect your sovereignty there. And I just want to help give you resources and, and tell you what I think you might consider. So raw liver, just for humans in general, is good for, it's basically a multivitamin. And this is why we built hardened soil and we make desiccated organs so that people can get it more easily. If you want to get fresh organs, that's great. Desiccated organs are really valuable as well, but it's a multivitamin. If you look at the nutritional content of liver, there I don't think there's anything on the planet that compares. You know, half an ounce, an ounce of liver is full of so many things that are difficult to get other places. I could list it out and I have in the past, but it's kind of boring just to do this this long list of, of nutrients, but you know, just off the top, K2, choline, uh, zinc with copper, vitamin A, B12, I mean, biotin, folates, riboflavin, so many good things in liver. And I think you'll understand this physically, subjectively when you eat it. Um, it doesn't have to be raw. There are other ways to ingest liver depending on what your preference. A lot of people, and this is one of my favorite things, they feel it when they eat it, they get energy. And whether that's methylation systems coming back online from the folate and the riboflavin or um, biochemical 
reactions or detoxification happening. Like liver is nourishing and humans feel it. It, it just, it lights us up, which is a great thing. In terms of with what to feed children, um, I think that if I had kids, uh, the first foods for my children would be meat and organs. And I personally, if I trusted the source of the liver, um, I would give my children raw liver. If, if I were worried about the sourcing of the liver or the potential for contamination, I might cook the liver or put it, um, so cook liver in a smoothie or put some desiccated organs from hardened soil into a smoothie. You can get more organs than just the liver. Um, if I had children, at, at once the breastfeeding was done, um, I would think about incorporating raw milk from cows or goats into their diet. And there, the concerns here are always the contamination. There's always a concern of contamination with any raw food. This is a risk we take as being humans. Um, I've never had a problem with raw milk. I think most kids are fine with it. My niece and my nephew do fine with raw milk. But make that decision as a parent with what you're comfortable on. Obviously, understand the sourcing there. I wouldn't stop the breastfeeding from a human mom to a baby to give raw cow's milk or goat's milk. But I think when the breastfeeding stops, raw, raw milk is great for kids. And there's consistently studies that associate the consumption of raw dairy, whether kids grow up on or off farms with lower rates of asthma, eczema, mm -hmm. and allergies. Um, it appears to be this undenatured whey protein that's protective for humans. And so I wish I'd had raw milk growing up um, and I find so many benefits to raw milk. Mm -hmm. Raw milk contains the lactase enzyme, so many unique nutrients in there and it just tastes really good. And I think that it's just, it's gotta be more nutritious than the, the pasteurization and the homogenization, the homogenization process. And when you're getting raw milk, you're getting it from a, usually a small producer, hopefully mm -hmm. the cows are grass fed. So I think the first foods for infants could be, if they were my kids or my families, um, you know, meat and organs, that's what kids want. And the sooner you feed your kids organs, whether they're fresh, cooked or desiccated, um, the more they're gonna like them late in life. There's so many joyous anecdotes of friends or people that message me on Instagram or social media with their little, like their kids who are just little carnivores and they just love liver and they just go crazy for meat and they get so excited about it. And you can almost, I think I can see this in their eyes. They're just lit up. These brains are just so excited. They're just growing and building these brains and these neural connections. I mean, so much is happening in your child as they're growing from infancy, birth to I mean, it happens into the 20s, but especially when they're young, the first seven years, that I, th I think feeding them meat and organs, feeding them nutrient-rich foods, I mean, that's such a gift to give to them. And, and I would not hesitate to do that as soon as you want to, but use your judgment. Did I answer your question? Is there anything else I can tell you? Yes, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I did have one last question. Sure. I did want to know, like, what are your thoughts on the brand Siete? Yeah, so Siete does cassava like stuff, right? Yes. Like, what do you think about like their foods in general? Like, yeah, I'd have to see the label. Anything with seed oils, I'm not going to be a fan of. Anything with carrageenan, which is a binder, I'm not going to be a fan of. Um, cassava is a root, and cassava contains isothiocyanates. We know this. Isothiocyanates is this fancy word for this class of chemicals that kind of binds iodine and prevents their absorption in the human body, potentially causing thyroid issues. So with, if it were my kids, my niece and nephew, I wouldn't be super stoked about cassava tortillas from the iodine perspective. Every once in a while, it's probably better than gluten. I think gluten-free options are probably better than gluten-containing options mm -hmm. for kids in general, but I wouldn't make it a staple um, in terms of that. I think that some of these roots can be problematic for humans depending on how they react to them. I'd have to see the label specifically to see if there's anything else in there, but hopefully that gives you a guide. Yes, that does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for calling in. And Gabriella, I can add a little bit of nuance here because I have a three and a half year old at home. And um, when we started to feed raw foods um, and, and real foods, uh, practicing like baby led weaning, you kind of present the kid with an abundance of options and just see what it's drawn to. And, and my son Jai went straight for the meat and straight for the fruit. Um, and it was very intuitive. And to this day, you know, three and a half years old, he's not interested in a single vegetable. Like this kid doesn't want a single vegetable. Uh, he loves raw cheese. We get the desiccated organs into almost every one of his meals that are kind of like a micro dosing approach, like one pill just in his eggs, one pill on the butter that's going on his, you know, gluten-free pasta or something like that. It's just a way to look at approaching this and, and letting them tell you. But it was very interesting to see that play out. You know, meat is, is, a, is a huge hit, organs and fruit, huge hits. It's almost like intuitively they know they don't need this, you know, the, the, we put the broccoli on the plate purely as an experiment because I thought it would be hilarious to have a video of this. And it's exactly what you see. Screaming kids, throwing it on the floor, not interested. You put the piece of ribeye down, it's like 
sucking on it, biting on the bone, gnawing on the steak, and it is awesome to see. So the last point on the Siete stuff, you know, to Paul's point, the good news about that is because what you said about gluten-free options being better than conventional options and then going a step further and having these, you know, more natural options, they do use cassava in some of the products and they also use almond flour. And we know there's some issues there with plant defense compounds, you know, lectins, etc. But again, if you are trying to just replace really bad snacks that are full of seed oils with something that is way less offensive, it can be the bridge in gap to keep your sanity as a parent when your kid wants a snack and you don't want them eating Cheez-Its and goldfish and all of this rubbish that's got gluten in it and seed oils and there are better options. So just celebrating you, mama, for thinking about this stuff and setting yourself up um, and setting your family up for optimal health. So thank you for those questions and calling me. That was awesome. And Mr. Paul, that is a wrap for the show. We we did it. We got another one in the bag. I'm sure there'll be many more to come, but closing thoughts, anything that you want to kind of add, wrap up, what's what's going on in your life? What are, what are we going to see from Paul moving forward? Anything that you want to share, my friend? Yeah, so we've got a documentary in the works. Ooh. It's just now in the infancy, but we are, we're working with a studio in Los Angeles and have an executive producer. And I really want to create something. It's going to be a bit, so you guys be patient. It's going to be probably a year, mm -hmm. six months to a year of filming. But I want to create something that... Um, stands alongside vegan documentaries, you know, oh, nice. because and in, in, in distinction and against vegan documentaries, because there is misleading stuff in yes. those documentaries. The question today was so good about how do we think about studies? Because I think of some vegan documentaries and they say, meat is associated with a 400% increase in death. And you think, oh my God, so misleading, right? So I want to showcase the myriad examples of people curing autoimmune mm -hmm. disease, I want to feature hopefully the study we're going to do at Utah State University with Stephen Van Vliet. And I, I want to show people that meat is part of a healthy diet mm -hmm. and how healing that can be so that when people inevitably are told by their friends, you have to watch this vegan documentary <laughs> sponsored by, you know, your, your major blockbuster director du jour or your mega billionaire tech entrepreneur du jour, uh, they can say, well, what about this animal mm -hmm, documentary? Because mm -hmm. I saw this documentary on whatever your streaming platform is, and there's a bunch of people getting better eating meat. So I want to create something like that. That's so needed, yeah. man. I hope you can get it onto the big platforms and the, uh, oh, the powers will. that be. Oh, yeah, yeah, we will. Don't well, we'll see, but Keep you quiet, you know, because yeah. that, man, would that be needed. That is a beautiful Even counter. if it's on the small platforms. It'll spread. It'll spread, yeah. right? We put it on YouTube eventually. I mean, like, you know, the Vimeo, Hulu, like, we'll get it to streaming platforms. I think Netflix will carry it when they see the interest, yes. um, but it will be interesting to, to kind of see what those political waters are like with a uh, with a meat documentary. The resistance is coming and its <laughs> flavor is beef. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you, man. I, I appreciate everything that you're doing to keep just spreading this message and the growth speaks to how you're approaching it, your ability to constantly evolve and change your mind and, and be what you said, authentic, which is so massive. So thank you, Paul. That's Thanks, it, brother. Tim. Boom. Love it. We did another one. We'll see Let's you next Wednesday. Thank you so much for just being an awesome audience, asking great questions, being along for this ride. Stay radical. Woo! If you guys are watching this on my podcast, check out the Radical Health Radio. I'm so excited about this podcast. Obviously, Steve is amazing. He's eloquent. I love spending time with him. This is There's a whole YouTube page for Radical Health Radio. There's amazing stuff on this podcast, which is why I wanted to feature it on mine. <clears throat> one of the things about my podcast, Fundamental Health, is it can get a little technical, but I think if you're into things that are a little high level. Radical Health Radio is for you. Hopefully you guys will check out what we're doing here at Hard and Soil. Steve's amazing. So it's a gift to you guys. Ooh, thank you, brother. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, friends. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Radical Health Radio. We got a fresh new podcast for you every Wednesday. If you enjoyed the show, consider liking, subscribing, reviewing, and rating us on your podcast platform. It helps to spread this message of radical health. We'll see you next week.